Hey Groves, welcome back. I'm live and in person this time as opposed to a rewind from eight years ago. So if I've aged, that's what's happened. Uh, hey, before we kind of dive into kind of get into the very end of our series in Revelation, both on Sunday mornings and in Groves, I just want to kind of mention this to you because I think it's important as we get to the end of this cycle um, is that uh, we've had these students, uh, middle school and high school, and some adults that have been volunteering, uh, working behind the scenes to make it possible for a lot of our families to be in a grove. And I don't know if some of you may not realize this because you may be in a grove that doesn't meet at the hub, but literally we have uh, Sprouts meeting on Sundays, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays um, for kids and people with families uh, that need child care and us to be investing in the next generation while they are being invested in and grows. And so there's over 30 kids that have been in this. There's over 15, um, again, middle school and high school students have been doing this. So I really want to ask a favor of you, whether you are in a grove that meets at the hub and you get to see this firsthand, or if you're one that meets in a home and you don't get to see this firsthand, is that as a body, as a, as a church family, uh, we want to come around these students that have been, been working behind the scenes to make this all possible. And so I would love for you, if you have your phone, uh, you know, to go to the Church Center app, um, and you can go to Give. And uh, on there, you can scroll down to different things to give and give to uh, Grove Babysitting um, and uh, Sprout uh, should be one title there. And, and if every every adult gave 20 bucks, uh, then we'd be able to really support these, these, these students and help them go on their mission trips this summer. So to me, it's, it's a win-win because they're investing in the next generation and we're going to invest in them who are the next generation as they prepare to go on their uh, summer camps and their mission trips and everything else. So if you would do that, I would be really appreciative because we really want to be able to fund that and be able to support those students who have been working uh, week in and week out to make this all possible. So just my little plug there. Uh, but as we come to the end of Revelation, I think it's vitally important. It's interesting because, you know, we've been kind of going on Sunday mornings on one level, and then we've been going on our groves in a different level, and we're kind of catching up with each other, if that makes any sense. We've been filling in a lot of the stuff that we haven't been able to talk about on Sunday morning in our groves, and basically we kind of today are, are pretty much getting to the point where we're kind of catching up with each other almost, uh, and it, we kind of catch up with each other when we reach this point of Armageddon. Because as I've been saying about the the Bible is cyclical, Revelation is not, not the Bible, but the Revelation is cyclical and that it keeps kind of going back and kind of going over the same territory. And so maybe you've been curious because on Sunday mornings, we kind of skipped ahead to Revelation 19. And even this past Sunday, we started talking about the wedding uh, and all this other stuff in Revelation chapters 20. And we're getting ready for 21, 22. Uh, and we kind of had to kind of glaze over kind of 14 to the beginning of 19. And so maybe you're like, well, what's going on with that? Why did we do that? And, and again, we did it because a lot of the, the ground is the same ground and they all kind of reach this pinnacle moment uh, that we saw in Revelation 19 when Jesus returns triumphant on this white victory horse uh, and he's going to stamp out evil. He's going to stamp out the darkness. He's going to stamp out Satan uh, and the Antichrist and those things we talked about last week in Groves. And so he's come. And so he's finally come. He's finally returned. It's the return of the king and he's going to make things right. Um, and so we kind of glazed over some of the specifics in there because in some of those chapters we saw a third cycle and a fourth cycle which were a little bit repetitive because they all end up at Armageddon, but they give us some added details. Uh, and so I kind of want to go back and just kind of read some of those things and kind of explain that and then talk about this moment that we are getting to, uh, which is this wedding, <coughs> this wedding supper of the Lamb. Uh, but back in chapter 14, uh, we see these three angels, and they're kind of speaking out. There's messengers from God, and they're talking about these things, and they make these announcements and says, fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And then another angel follows him and says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And so this is where we get this introduction of Babylon that we're going to talk about here in a moment. But Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. So we'll come back to that. <coughs> and a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and the image and receives its mark on their foreheads or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. And that's pretty serious. Uh, and it eventually goes on in verse 12. So this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and who remain faithful to Jesus. Like, this is this is some tough stuff. Uh, but basically, he's talking about these angels, and we see these angels that make these pronouncements saying, hey, it's time. 
The time has come. The wait is over. Uh, he's coming. Now it's going to be full strength wrath. It's not going to be like one third like we saw in the past. Like it's the full wrath of God against those who have risen up against him. And at the end of 14, we see another end of the cycle as we come to Armageddon and the harvesting of the earth and the trampling of the wine press and all the stuff we talked about. And then we hear in chapter 15 about these seven angels with seven plagues. Uh, if you've been keeping up, we had seven seals, which led to seven trumpets, which led to seven thunders that we didn't get explained. And now we have seven plagues, which actually are the seven bulls of God's wrath, where he says, now you're going to get full strength, God's wrath upon you. But as he does this, as he makes this announcement of these, these bulls of wrath that are going to be poured out on the earth, again, we come back to this idea where he says, hey, great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, king of the nations. What you are doing is just, and what you are doing is true. It's a true verdict. You have to make the call. In fact, I was at a game last night for Buford High School, a soccer game, and I, you know, I mentioned before the yellow card, red card thing, and how infuriated we get when a referee makes a horrible call, an unjust call. Uh, and there was one of those calls that could have been a game changer where uh, he called off sides and I was literally watching the guy to make sure he wasn't off sides and he was a good three feet on sides. And some of you don't know soccer, you don't know what this means anyways. Uh, but either did this referee apparently because he called him back uh, and I was like, everybody was like, what are you talking about? That guy was so not offsides. Uh, he had the chance to score the, uh, the winning goal or to take the lead. Uh, it was one-on-one -on -one with a goalie and he called it back and it was just like, ah, you know, ref, you're horrible. Uh, and so this idea again, that we want God to judge and God has got to balance. And this is the tension that we and God, in that sense, has to live between God and his love and his kindness and his grace and his mercy, but also his justice. And now he can't just keep letting these flagrant violations just go on or he's not just and he's not right. And so that's what we're crying out to God. God, you are just and you are true. You see everything. And so we trust that you are going to be just and you're going to judge correctly. And so then he begins pouring out these bowls of God's wrath. And that's what we see. Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. And we see this result as they just continue to refuse to repent, refuse to repent. We will not bow down to you. We will not acknowledge you as God. We will not repent of our sins. They refuse, they refuse, they refuse. And at the end of that cycle in chapter 16, it says, it is done. It finishes it all, says, it's complete. It's done. This is over. We're finished. The wrath has been poured out, and now we're, it's, everything's being made new. Because now we have eradicated sin. We have eradicated evil. We have stamped it out. And so now things can begin anew and begin fresh, and he's going to make everything new. And this is where we're going to roll into the new heavens and the new earth and all these things that we get to look forward to. But in chapter 17 and chapter 18, we come to this time where he starts talking about this image of Babylon which he mentioned back, the angels mentioned a couple chapters ago. So I was talking about Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great. And so for us, we're like, well, what's it talking about? In fact, in my Bible, it's actually titled Babylon the Prostitute on the Beast. And so maybe you're like, well, what is Babylon? What is that? Why, why are we even using this, this old term of this old empire forever ago? It's Babylon is kind of symbolic. And it's symbolic of the world system, the, the stronger world system that we're trying to, we're being asked or being forced or being compelled to kind of submit to. And as I said earlier, to commit adultery with and basically cheat on God with and astray uh, away from God with. And so Babylon is often referred to as like a prostitute, a prostitute who is you're being unfaithful to and with. Uh, and God has called us, by the way, has referred to us as the bride. And that's what we see in Revelation 19. Uh, that's what we see later on. He's calling us the bride of Christ. He says in actually chapter 19, verse 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And fine linen, in parentheses, stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. He's saying we're being asked, we're being called to be the, pri the bride, and God, as, as the groom, has invited us 
to basically be married to him. And that's the imagery we're using because that's when we can all understand of marriage. He's saying, no, we're going to be together and we're going to be together forever like we've talked about on Sunday morning, uh, this past Sunday morning. And so that's what he's saying, he's saying the wedding lamb of God has come and the bride has prepared herself. In fact, in chapter 21, fast forward uh, in verse 2, he says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And he's saying, look, now God's dwelling place is now with the people and he's going to dwell among them and they're going to be his people. He's going to be their God. He's going to wipe away every tear. There's not going to be any more, any more of this nonsense, any more of death or suffering or pain. All that is gone. And so he's saying it's going to happen because he says it's this wedding and we're going to become one. And it's, inter it's interesting because in the Old Testament, uh, God referred to Israel as the bride. And as like, hey, we're we're gonna we're being married and we're gonna become one and you're you're my bride and so you've saved yourself for me, right? And yet in the Old Testament we see constantly that the bride cheats on the groom. Uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter one verse twenty one, it says, "See how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She was once filled, full of justice, righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers." He says, basically, you've turned against me. You've forgotten me. Uh, in Jeremiah, <laughs> Jeremiah chapter, uh, I don't know, I got the, got the wrong bookmark there. Throw that one out. In Jeremiah chapter 2, it says, The word of the Lord came to me to proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. And so he compares Israel to being his bride. And being his, his, his love, somebody that he loves and adores. And it gets really graphic in Jeremiah. Because he basically says, look, you, you've, you've been unfaithful. Like, you've gone against me. If you're my bride, you've soiled yourself. You've given yourself over to others, to Babylon. You become a prostitute in that sense. And he says this in verse 23. How can you say, I am not defiled? I have not run after the Baals. See how you behaved in the valley. Consider what you have done. And he actually compares him to a camel. You are a swift she-camel running here and there. You're like a wild donkey, accustomed to the desert, sniffing the wind in her craving. In her heat, who can restrain her? Any males that pursue her need not tire themselves. At mating time, they will find her. Did you catch that? That's kind of a horribly graphic thing. It's like you're like a wild donkey and you're in heat. And you're just like any any donkey that once comes along, you're just like, here I am, have your way with me. He's like, that's what you have done. That's what Israel has done. Some of you guys may be familiar with the prophet Hosea uh, and how God calls him to marry a woman who is unfaithful named Gomer. And it's like over and over and over, he says, for like... He says this in chapter 1, verse 2 of Hosea. He says, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. He's saying this is an example of what you have done with me and how you have committed adultery against me and you have cheated on me and you have sold yourselves into prostitution basically with all these other nations, with all these other gods, and you're bowing down to them, but you have abandoned me, your groom. And so that's the imagery that we find in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Babylon, the prostitute on the beast. And it says, with her, the kings of the earth committed adultery. They cheated on God. They turned away from God. And they just said, hey, we're going to sleep with anybody. And we're going to sleep with all these other people. And it's interesting because Babylon, if you know the history of, of Israel, is the people that came in under Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC and wiped them out. Destroyed the temple just completely leveled the place, dragged them off into exile, uh, the survivors where they were there for over 70 years. And this is that's Babylon. That's the system. And Babylon's the place where Nebuchadnezzar, remember the story of Daniel, uh, you know, and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where he says, you must bow down to this image of me. And they refuse, right? And they get thrown into the fiery furnace because they would not submit and prostitute themselves uh, with the gods or the god of Babylon at that point. And so that was, it always kind of Babylon represents the world system and what the world is telling us to do and who the world is telling us to sleep with or marry or to cheat on God with. Uh, and so at the time of uh, Daniel, it was Babylon. 
uh, which, by the way, is where the Tower of Babel was, which is kind of where one of the original rebellions was when God said, hey, go, go and spread yourselves out all over the place and multiply. And they said, no, we're going to gather ourselves here together. And we're going to make our own way to heaven and we're going to build this tower to the gods because we don't we don't need your input, God. And so it's kind of always been this Babel, Babylon. Uh, at the time of John, it would have been Rome. You must bow down to the system of Rome. You must do what Rome tells you to do. You must bow down to the Roman gods and submit to them and prostitute yourselves with them. So the question is, well, what is it, what is it today? What would you consider the, the worldwide movement uh, that's saying, hey, push yourself up against God and say, we don't need you and we're casting you off uh, like we read in Psalm chapter 2. Uh, hey, we, we're, we're not going to bow down. We're going to take off these shackles. We're not going to, your anointed one? Who's your anointed one? And it says God laughs at them like, what? I've, I've appointed my king uh, and wh who are you? You're, you're not going to displace him off of his throne, uh, right? But that's kind of what we see happen. And so the question is, ultimately, who are we going to listen to? Who are we going to kneel to? Who are we going to bow down to? Because in this final cycle, it kind of goes symbolic again, 17, 18, beginning of 19, where it's talking about Babylon. And will we kneel to the beast? Will we kneel to the Antichrist? Will we kneel to the world system? Or will we say, even though it's going to call for patient endurance, and this is tough, like, no thank you. There is one true God, and I only kneel to him like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I, we will not. We will not. And if that puts us in the furnace, so be it. But we will not. We will not. I'm going to keep myself as the bride. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to be unfaithful. I'm not going to be inconsistent. I am going to endure because I know who I'm saving myself for. And basically, that's the beauty uh, at the end of Revelation is Jesus returns for the bride, uh, who is us, and have we kept ourselves from being soiled by the world? And have we been faithful and have we been true? And it's interesting because I've been reading in Psalms, you know, just personally, uh, and you just see all this imagery all over the place of adultery, of cheating on God, of the saints, you know, saying, hey, God, when are you going to come? You know, how long do we have to wait? And remember the prayers being our bowls of incense before his throne? And then finally here we see those bowls of incense, now God's wrath being cast on the earth because he's like, look, you're not going to wait forever. I'm just telling you to hold on because there's a few more that are going to come in. So wait, be patient, uh, suffer through this, but endure. But the wedding is coming where we're going to be united together. And I... I I don't want to be what it says. This is what I read this morning, Psalm 78. But they put God to the test and rebelled against the Most High. They did not keep his statues. Like their ancestors, they were disloyal. They were faithless, as unreliable as a faulty boat. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be labeled disloyal, faithless, and unreliable. I want God to look at me and say, hey, bride, you have been loyal you have been faithful, and you have been reliable. And so now welcome to the wedding supper of the Lamb uh, because you've been invited, and will you endure? Will you make it to the wedding day uh, where we will be united together forever? So hopefully some of that imagery helps you as we kind of merge Sunday morning with where we're finally caught up to uh, in our growth. But we got one more week. Um, so I hope your discussion as you guys look at 17 and 18 will start to make some sense as you talk about Babylon uh, and how we can endure. So we will check back in with you next week.